Okay, welcome Pahrump. I'm Dr. Michael Reiner, your host of the Independent Doctors of Pahrump, and tonight is Monday night, and this is the first live show after uh, the, of the new year. I was supposed to do one last Monday, but got caught up in um, a bad plane flight, so couldn't make it back. So um, I'm glad to be back and be doing this show again. Um, tonight, one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, in depth, and one of these topics that came up in a patient conversation was about antibiotics. This is a cold and flu season, and one of the things we as physicians battle with a lot is um, people requesting antibiotics. Uh, they get a cold, they get a sniffle, um, they're sure they have a sinus infection, they're sure they have a, a bronchitis, and antibiotics are what they need. And this has been a major problem in medicine, and one of the problems we uh, deal with a lot of antibiotic resistance today is because of the overuse or maybe indiscriminate use of um, antibiotics. And um, as you go to the physician, one of the things that you leave with, besides maybe uh, a statement or a super bill, is a prescription. And so it is what you expect or what a lot of patients expect after um, visiting to a physician's office. And um, so that's one of the things we need to talk about. The spelling that rumor is just that, you know, what about bacterial infections and, and what makes a bacterial infection treatable by antibiotics and what symptoms would you might look for um, in, in dealing with a, a, an acute bacterial infection. Uh, most of the infections that we see are actually viral infections. Um, and uh, rarely, or at least in, in some cases, does a bacterial infection come out of a viral infection. And usually those are when you've been suffering with a cold or flu for at least a week and it doesn't seem to be getting any better or it seems to be getting better and then it seems to get worse all of a sudden um, and or the symptoms may change. Fever is not a reliable indication of a bacterial infection or a viral infection. Um, one of the things I used to subscribe to was that a fever greater than 101.5 was some type of bacterial infection. And that's not necessarily true. Viral infections um, can indeed cause a high fever. Your symptoms of a sore throat could be due to viral. In fact, uh, one of the things we fear is, is strep infections. Um, and the reason we treat streptococcal infections is not to get rid of the infection, but to prevent our body from developing a late reaction to the streptococcal bacteria and one specific strain. So what that means is, is that if you get the true beta strep infection in your throat and you do not get it treated, your body will eventually get rid of the infection itself. And in the process, it builds up antibodies to the, that bacteria. And those antibodies can actually attack certain areas of your body. It can attack your kidneys, it can attack your um, your joints and it can attack your heart. And if it attacks your heart, um, you can basically get valvular disease. If it attacks your joints, you can get an arthritis. And if it attacks your kidneys uh, severe enough, you can get kidney failure. So um, that's the reason we treat streptococcal and streptococcal sore throats is not to get rid of the infection, but to prevent you from developing those late problems. And that's why we do strep tests. But when you look in the back of a throat, a viral infection is usually has a cobblestone appearance to the back of the throat. It doesn't have this um, uh, exudative or pus on the back of the throat. And in reality, what I see a lot of in the office that are strep throats, um, the, the back of the throat is completely swollen and the uvula, which is the soft palate, uh, it basically has small red dots on it. So that's the hyperemic state from the strep. The back of the throat looks uh, just swollen. Um, sometimes it does have a little exudate. And that's differentiated from tonsillitis. Tonsillitis is a totally different animal and is not strep. Uh, people need to understand that the most common causes of tonsillitis is, especially in the youth age, is basically a, um, a mononucleosis virus. And uh, there are also other viruses like that, but exudative tonsillitis in the teenager's uh, age is usually a mono-like virus. And um, that same virus in the, in the teens, if caught by young children, and we don't experience that in this particular uh, society due to our better improved hygiene, 
But in Africa, um, mononucleosis causes Burkitt's lymphoma in young children. So um, it, is a, it is a potentially dangerous disease, but mono, a lot of people look in the back of the throat and they see pus and you know, they think they got a bacterial infection and that's absolutely not true. Uh, so strep is a particular one of those things, but it, it, it is a subtype of an infection and it is one of those things that needs to be treated rapidly with, with penicillin. So if you're prone to strep, which some people are, uh, I would suggest you get into the doctor's office uh, to be tested for strep if you develop that. Um, I don't even test for it. I, I clinically diagnose it um, because I can tell a strep throat. Um, for the most part, uh, differentiated on its clinical findings, um, but some people like to do a, a strep test, and I think it's a, they're they're very inaccurate. I want to use my clinical judgment um, to uh, tell you whether or not you need antibiotics. Um, upper respiratory infections like colds and flus, well, they're obviously you know nine ten nine times out of ten um, they are um, uh, viral. Okay, so. Let's see, there is a live phone number, 727-8750, and I think we have Ray, the flagman, on the, on the uh, phone. Ray, are you there? Yes, I am, Doctor. How are you doing tonight? Great. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I tried the last two weeks. I didn't know you on tape. I must have called 19 times one night before Vern returned to call to me and said it was on tape. <laughs> I'm trying to get through. Sorry I've about that. I've got this question for the last couple of weeks, so even though it's off subject, maybe you can help me out. Back in 2002, there was a Scientific American article about nanoshells. Nanoshells were, uh, was a way of treating cancerous tumors through an injection of a gold substance that would, would migrate into the cancer cells, and then some uh, ultraviolet rays would apply, and in mice, the tumors were disappearing in hours. Has there been any research that has furthered that? How far are we going with nano shells right now because that seems like something that should really be looked into are you familiar with that at all i've never heard of that um ray um but um it did the the latest developments in in cancer chemotherapy uh and dr maddie i think who does an eye on cancer would probably be a better doctor to answer that uh, but they have been targeting more of uh, your immune system to target the actual tumor cells themselves uh, to, to wipe out that tumor. Uh, and this might be along that particular uh, um, area. And what I think they're doing is they're basically, the nanoshells might be sensitizing certain tumor cells to the effects of the ultraviolet radiation and, or the ultraviolet uh, light. And so they may become more susceptible to that um, um, treatment and therefore they'd be more likely to be destroyed and and uh, that is a common practice in some cancers is is making them more susceptible to that um, but I have not heard of that but um, certainly um, I would think about um, you know calling in and talking to Dr. Matty uh, who does if he does allow call-ins but thanks for calling in I appreciate uh, you do calling in thank you thank you have a good night yeah you do the same thank you and so we were talking about uh, uh, upper respiratory infections like viral infections and um, colds and flus. And obviously you're going to get those. I talked about that a long time ago in a previous show in dealing with the Ebola issue um, about uh, touching the hands to the face is one of the uh, more common ways to spread that particular virus. And um, that is um, usually how we catch a cold. Someone sneezes in the air, we touch a doorknob, uh, we touch our face, and we basically get the virus um, on our face, and then we, uh, um, we incorporate that. And usually it's a runny nose, sore throat um, type of thing. And then as gravity pulls that virus down out of our upper respiratory infection, it gets down into our chest where we may develop a bronchitis and uh, we may develop further symptoms uh, related to that. Um, sometimes, uh, most likely, we may produce phlegm, um, a mucus, and as I've told patients, green and brown is, tends to be normal. Uh, yellow tends to be bacterial, uh, but your symptoms tend to be what would determine whether or not I would want to prescribe an antibiotic to that. 
Uh, certainly duration of, an, of infection tends to be a problem. If you're going longer than a week, uh, most viral illnesses are will crescendo in one to two days. Uh, they will peak at about three or four and maybe take close to seven to go away. Uh, if they're lasting longer than that, uh, you may either have a immune deficiency, which makes it harder to clear it. Uh, you may have gotten re-exposed to another infection, you know, one on top of the other, and uh, that might present a, a problem uh, for you in that respect. So again, uh, if you're prone to having COPD, having diabetes, having other illnesses, I would advise most people to get into the doctor uh, pretty early. One of the things I end up doing is usually uh, when I'm n and not sure about where this is going, I sometimes will prescribe uh, three days of, of an appropriate antibiotic uh, with the idea that they could take it seven, meaning that if you get better within a very short period of time of taking the antibiotic, chances are it's working for you. And if you're taking longer to get rid of it, then maybe it may not be, or you may be developing um, a resistance uh, or having a resistance to that particular antibiotic. Now, when we come back, we're going to be taking a break here in a few minutes. And um, when I come back, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about antibiotics per se, and we're going to go through some slides. Uh, we're going to talk about antibiotics, antibiotics resistance, the different types of antibiotics, and things that uh, you need to look for as a patient uh, when being prescribed antibiotics. And if everybody adopted the, the idea that you were going to hold off as long as you possibly could uh, when being prescribed an antibiotic, uh, there would be a lot less resistance in there for the antibiotics that you would be prescribed in the future uh, would be uh, very effective. Um, and one of the things to think about is, is why do we develop antibiotics resistance? And think about the life cycle of a bacteria and that they're hours and minutes. And think about the life cycle of a human being. It could be 70 years. So as we evolve over time, think how many lifespans a bacteria can evolve in a lifespan of a human. It's, it's astronomical. Uh, the number. So being exposed to things accelerates it and, and makes it change. Not only that, you have an internal resistance. So I think we're going to take a break now. When we come back, we're going to bring in the slides. And again, thank you for tuning into the show tonight. I'm Dr. Michael Reiner.